Welcome back. Um, thanks for finding me again and hanging out. Today we're going to talk about something called uh, hollow jaw because it's easier to say hollow jaw, and, uh, although it's a little creepy. It's easier to say that than focal osteoporotic bone marrow defect. So we're just going to go with hollow jaw. And I've been waiting to, to use that effect for a little while. I'm not going to lie. But uh, yeah, so welcome back. And so as you can see with the x-ray there, uh, this is in relation generally to placing implants. This is the, the only real time it's going to be a big deal um, because you're actually drilling in bone and you're trying to find space to put in a screw. Osteoporosis is basically characterized by um, low bone mass, my, microarchitectural disruption, and increased skeletal fragility. So I think most of us really know what osteoporosis is, but how does it affect you know, when you're placing an implant in a mandible. It's usually in a mandible, and it's usually in a woman, and it's usually in a, they say, postmenopausal or older women. It's a thing, and so this is what we're basically talking about today, how to recognize some of the findings on x-rays, particularly on a CT scan. So this is a study, and this was written about in 1974. So this is a research article. Focal osteoporotic bone marrow defects of the jaws, an analysis of 197 new cases. So back in 1974, they were analyzing cases from before then, and they, they reported about this. So they described it then as asymptomatic radiolucencies, which are located in the mandibular molar regions of middle-aged women. That was back in the 70s, right? So, and if you go back, you know, even past the 70s, closer to now, there's a lot of it's really case reports. It's really not a lot of stuff still about this. Um, so that's why I'm just kind of bringing it out there and keeping it in, you know, the differential as far as uh, treatment planning and, and how things go. So this one is from the International Journal of Implant Dentistry. Focal osteoporotic bone marrow defect involving a dental implant, a case report. So another case report, right? This is an unusual case, they say, of a focal osteoporotic bone marrow defect involving the dental implant in the posterior mandible of an adult woman. So once again, the adult women, you know, sorry. And then this one basically is just talking about the focal osteoporotic bone marrow defect, FOBMD or hollow jaw, whatever you want to call it. Just saying it's uncommon. And what it really is, it's, you know, it's hemopoietic tissue um, or blood forming tissue that's found in edentulist areas. And that's key in the jaws of middle-aged women. Once again, the exact cause, we don't know. Maybe it's just failure of normal healing pattern in, you know, after a dental extraction and so forth. I'm going to present two cases in a little bit, just real quick videos. Two cases that I treated, both are adult women, both are edential areas. Honestly, the teeth have been removed in one case. The first case, the, the tooth was removed seven years ago, and it was just a list since then. So it's had quite a bit of time to repair, right? Second case um, on the lower right, um, you'll see that tooth was removed nine years ago and no, to, no implant was placed or anything. But so look at this x-ray. So if you see an x-ray like this and you're a dentist, a periodontist, oral surgeon, or, you know, dental student, I don't know, whatever, and you want to place some implants in this patient and you look, whoa, there's a spot on the left, there's a, two spots on the right, that looks amazing. You know, what does this CT scan look like? The vertical bone looks great, you know? So you look at the CT scan, this is a scan of the lower left, and you see, yeah, I use my software, I'm going to place an implant, wow, this is a 4.8 diameter implant, I could probably place an 8 millimeter diameter if I really wanted to, right? Um, everything looks great. And so let's just plan for the implant. And so what are we missing on this scan? You know, this is one of those things that after the fact, oh yeah, look at that cortical bone. Look how thick it is. Is that too thick? You know, is that strange? These are the little things we can see ahead of time now, you know, kind of going over these cases. These are the things I look for. So if the patient fits the, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the adult middle-aged women or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, and the CT scan looks like this and that cortical bone looks super thick, right? It's thick. Uh, it's possible, right? So again, looking at this, you know, the, the thicker cortical bone, this is a compensation for low density. So with that, what I'm trying to say in this picture is if you look at a scan in these patients and you get a, a you know, a coronal section and you see that cortical bone thickness and it looks super thick to you, what's happening, what we think is happening is it's the cortical bone, the outside layer of bone is compensating for the, for the low bone density on the inside. So it thickens. It's harder on the outside. So the cortical bone is, is, is firm. But once you pop through that and you're placing an implant, now you're getting into that really weak, you know, marrow space, but it's not even that. It's just mushy tissue that can't hold a screw, right? In fact, if you put an implant, and you'll see in this one case, I put an implant in and it, 
it was torquing and all of a sudden I felt a pop on the torque wrench and it implant just sunk in and then it was like floating in there. I could like hit the top of the implant and it was just kind of like, like a buoy in the ocean, just floating in there. And if I pushed it down, it would probably turn sideways and maybe float three teeth away. So that's how crazy this can be. Right? So let's get into the video. How's that? Let's just do that. So in this video you're seeing on the lower left here, I just drilled four millimeters with the first drill and then I felt a pop. And then I put the guide pin in and it, the guide pin went down past 10 or 12 millimeters and it started floating around in there. And so it basically entered into this defect. So the top part was, was, you know, well mineralized, but then once it got past four millimeters, it just sunk in and you can see it just floating in there. I just debrided it and I'm grafting it back with allograft. We're going to come back and, and check it and then, you know, hopefully place an implant down the line. But I just cleaned all that stuff out of there. And that's the, that's basically the plan, right? You hopefully it remineralizes again and you're able to place, place the implant. So just closing that up, but that's the lower left, you know, so you can see how, how this is sometimes unexpected, you know, cause you're looking at that scan, you're going, wow, that's quite a bit of space. So I'm, I'm good shape. This one's interesting. So you look at that cortical bone on the pre-op again, right? So I placed this implant and it was, I was actually to the part where I was torquing it in and all of a sudden I heard a pop and it just sunk in and just started floating like this. And so it just entered one of those defects and I'm just trying to get it out so it doesn't float away from me. Cleaning it all out and you can see what I'm taking out of there. It's just hemopoietic tissue and you know, even though I just drilled in straight down, I could take the curette and then go almost sideways all the way around and there's a lot of space in there. So I'm just cleaning that out and grafting it. On this case, I was able to come back eight months later. I waited double the time. I usually wait four months. I waited eight months to replace it with an implant, and it was dense. So that actually fixed it. So in this case, I was able to clear out that defect, graft it after a good debris, and come back and actually place an implant about eight months later um, in this case. This is uh, this case on the lower right. And so I'm just preparing the implant site. Now I'm just placing the implant, you know, after eight months of waiting, after cleaning it out. And then it's tight, and I'm going to actually go into my torque wrench, you know, it's, it's, it's going in firm enough to be able to use a torque wrench on, which is great. And the implant's already in. And it's been now, it's in now for like a year and a half, two years. And so it's functioning well. So yeah, these are two interesting cases that I had. I'm just kind of looking at the literature and there's mostly case reports there. And so basically, this is what I'm talking about today. So you, you're in your office, you know, you're going to place an implant, the patient fits a demographic and you look at the bone, it just looks a little thick, right? So just something to think about. And, you know, these cases come up very infrequently, but I think they're interesting because, um, you know, they're deceiving if you're not looking for everything, you know, that's why CTs are pretty much the gold standard now for, um, radiographs, right. In the dental office for implants and, and things like that. So anyways, I hope that helps. Do you have any questions? Just let me know. Thanks for coming out.